Well, Malcolm, one thing I think we've learnt by um, talking together is that people like to know how we wrote this book. And so I thought you could talk about that and I'll correct you if you go wrong. <laughs> well, uh, uh, Melbourne University Press and some people have been wanting me to write a book uh, for quite some time. I hadn't wanted to because I knew to do it properly would involve an enormous amount of work and I wasn't prepared to do that. And secondly, I thought a lot of contemporary histories are out there to, um, you know, for self-justification, I'm right and the other fellow was wrong. And I was totally uninterested in that sort of a book. Anyway, um, I said to Louise Adler at one point, well, if you can find somebody who'll do all the work and somebody who can write, um, then, uh, you know, maybe I'll consider it. And... Margaret uh, appeared. She thought she was interviewing me to see whether she would or would not do the book. I thought I was interviewing her. <laughs> um, I must say, I was, you know, after we both decided, all right, we'd give it a go, um, I was nervous for quite a while till I, because words didn't appear on paper. And then a couple of draft chapters arrived, and I read them, and I thought, well, that seems readable, but I wasn't sure that I was any sort of a judge. I gave them to Tammy to look at, and I thought she'd read a page and a half and said, you know, I'll, I'll go through the rest of that later when I've got more time. But she actually read through to the end and said, well, that's very readable. She was interested. So I, from that moment on, I began to relax. I thought, <laughs> all right, we can have a book. Mm. But later on, Tammy accused me of writing like Barbara Cartland. <laughs> Well, that was only in describing her. Yes, exactly. I have to say that my struggles with what went in and what came out were, were much tougher with Tammy than with you. Well, I've always been easy to get on with. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Malcolm, turning to more serious matters, um, what is a liberal? Uh, somebody who has respect for other people, no matter who or what that other person is. Uh, somebody who, who believes uh, in a, a fair go, somebody who uh, wants to maximise freedom for individual people, so long as that freedom doesn't trample on the rights and freedoms of other people in society. Uh, a government that will not seek to maximise actions, but will seek to maximise opportunity for individuals to uh, follow their own path, but also a government that recognises that there are some things which governments just have to do, which individuals can't do for themselves, um, to establish a fair marketplace, to hold the ring, to see that the world is fair and that people are treated justly, that the rule of law, due process are followed. Um, sometimes, I think, in more recent times, uh, when people have said, you know, market deregulation, self-regulation, self uh, uh, corporations can do anything, banks can do anything, they won't ever be irresponsible. Uh, well, it was that attitude that led to the crash of a, a year or so ago, not so much in Australia, where I think we behaved more sensibly, but certainly in a number of European countries, in Britain and the United States. So while a liberal will want to maximise freedom for individuals, there are obviously limits to that freedom because you start to jeopardise the future of all of us. Uh, but a government, above all, that respects the rule of law, and that's something we haven't had in recent times. Mm. So where do we find the liberals today in politics? Um, well, I don't know many. <laughs> Petro Giorgio is a liberal. There were a few people who worked for him on... on uh, um, asylum seekers and children in detention, um, you know, which, which is a classic example of what a liberal ought not to do, indeed what any politician ought not to do. Um, but the Labour Party um, didn't seem to mind all that much. It's, it's supported the Howard government in totally illiberal anti-terrorist legislation, which could result in any one of you being arrested as you leave this hall. Um, and you won't know why you've been arrested I mean, at some point, and you can't tell anyone, you just disappear. That's not fantasy, it's in the law. And they only have to 
believe that you have observed something that um, might help them in their anti-terrorist inquiries. They don't have to believe you're guilty of anything. They know you're innocent. But they still have the power to detain you secretly. And if you talk about it afterwards, you can go to jail for five years. If a journalist writes about it, that journalist can go to jail for five years. Um, I think such laws really promote the cause of terrorism. I don't think they help in the fight against terrorism. But Labour and Liberal parties supported that sort of law. That's not a Liberal law. In my book, anyone who voted for it is not a Liberal. Well, that includes a large category of people, doesn't it? It, oh, it does. It, well, it includes the Labour Party and the Liberal Party in the Federal Parliament, or in the last Parliament. So was Malcolm Turnbull a Liberal? Is Malcolm Turnbull a Liberal? I think he's a Liberal, yes. I think his attitude about people... I'm not sure when he was leader that he was able to define this adequately. I think he should have. Um, one of the reasons why I think he was beaten, it was really the most terrible process, because forget about whether you believe in emissions trading or don't. He won the vote uh, in the Liberal Party. There was a block of National Party in the room voting against it. So there had to be a very substantial majority of Liberals in favour of it. But the people who were against Malcolm Turnbull were less not good enough, so then they had a spill motion. Then he won that. They said, look, we've got to get rid of this guy. I almost think they said, we've got to get rid of this guy because he's a liberal. <laughs> um, and they walked out. And the liberals turned tail and ran. They didn't fight. Um, and somehow the people who adopted these tactics... Um, um, got charge of the Federal Party. And so is Tony Abbott a Liberal? Well, he's uh, the leader of the Liberal Party. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Should I just leave a silence after that? Or? Well, if you like. Um, I, I think he's probably enormous. Look, he, he is proud of the word conservative. He describes the party as conservative. People, you know, want to pick up Ming's mantle and think that they're under his umbrella. But Menzies quite deliberately rejected the... the you know, he was f founding a new party. Because he had a great love of many things British, he might have thought, well, right, a Conservative Party in England, call the party here a Conservative Party. It had been called all sorts of things in the previous 40, 50 years. But no, that wasn't good enough for him. He would have regarded... If he was called a Conservative, he would have taken that as an insult as indeed I would have. He wanted a liberal party, which was liberal in philosophic terms, forward-looking, progressive, willing to make experiments, willing to create opportunity. Now, um, the liberal party is very good at denigrating people who should be its heroes. And the, um, Billy McMahon, Billy Snedden, John Gordon, all made statements, said things, did things, which tended to disassociate themselves from the Menzies' legacy. So I'm not like Menzies. Gordon got up in working clothes and said, I'm Australian to my boot heels, which was really having a, a jive at Ming, who'd said, I'm British to my boot heels. But a different day, a different time. But when you look at Menzies' education policy, his health policy, we might have then, in those days, had the best health scheme that we've ever had. I'm not sure about that, but it was certainly one that was designed to cover everyone in the community and at a reasonable cost. Uh, but his education policy, there'd be hundreds of thousands of people who've gone through universities who wouldn't have if Menzies hadn't turned the Commonwealth into the biggest funder of universities. In more recent years, governments have been trying to pull money back this university used to be, what, 70% funded by the Commonwealth? It's now, what, 23 4% funded by the Commonwealth? You know, a Liberal will want to invest in the future of the country, and the best investment is in the future of young Australians, because they're the people who will make this country in future years. And to compete, they need the best education available. Not the best education available in Australia, but an education that's as good as any available anywhere in the world. But governments provide less and less money. You know, one of the most illiberal acts was undertaken by a Labour Minister for Education, Dawkins. 
He wanted to get his sticky fingers on higher education policy. He wanted to tell academics and researchers what to do. So he abolishes the university's commission. Now, the, the Liberal Party, very much regret it, supported this legislation because they also wanted to get their sticky fingers into higher education policy. I think any federal government's policy in relation to universities has been extraordinarily reaction, reactionary and conservative and I think it is an enormous presumption for somebody who's a politician who happens to become a minister to think that they really know about higher education policy. It would be like um, making a corporal minister for the army and then giving that corporal total power to say what the army will do and what it won't do and to determine training methods and techniques. Now, that's obviously ludicrous, stupid. But anyway, that's where we've gone. Unfortunately, I, you know, to me, Menzies was a real liberal in so many elements of policy. So, you know, you've got to remember that you're going back 60 years, pretty much. Now, the first election that you contested for Wannan was the Petrov election, wasn't it? Mm. Mm. What do you remember? Uh, uh, well, perhaps you can take us back to those times, because certainly in your pre-selection speech and your speeches during the election, your radio addresses to the people of Wannan, you saw communism as the big threat, didn't you, to individual freedom, to liberal values? Yes, I did. And I think in those days it was. Again, it is, I think, extraordinarily difficult... Um, to take somebody who's not been part of that history and go back into an earlier time. My, uh, just to show that my father was in the unhappy generation to be in France for four and a half years in the First War and in uniform for five years in the Second. Uh, and the wars were 20 years apart. Now, the Second I knew about quite intimately because I was old enough to read papers and I, I knew he was too old to go overseas, which he greatly uh, annoyed him uh, in the Second War, but he posted all around Australia and whatever. So you're aware of what's happening and the disruption to everyone's life and, and, and the dangers. But the First War um, was just history. Something happened out of your time. Uh, so you weren't so conscious of it. You weren't aware of the deprivations, the hardships, the tragedy, the slaughter... And so now when people are going back to the, the 50s, for most Australians, that's out of their personal memory span. And I'm, uh, you know, so it's difficult, I think, to understand the circumstances. But the Soviet Union was regarded as an outward-looking, thrusting, aggressive force. Um, Soviet leaders regularly made speeches saying they had to bury all democracies because their systems would only be secure when democracy was dead. And America was the biggest democracy, so America had to be destroyed. If America was going to be destroyed, obviously we would. Um, that didn't stop the Americans, who knew they weren't going to be destroyed, sitting down and talking about how to make the world safer the next week with Russian leaders, which is a message for Bush and a few other people. Uh, but in 1948, Soviet tanks marched into uh, Czechoslovakia. In 1956, into Hungary. In 1968, again into Czechoslovakia. The, you had the Iron Curtain across Europe. Uh, you had communist-tempted coups in places like Greece in the early 1960s in Indonesia. The independence of Malaya was delayed 10 years while... Very large Malayan forces and police, supported by the British, Australian, New Zealanders, uh, fought off a communist insurrection in Malaya. So it was all relatively close and very, very real. Um, and I know there were people who felt, thought, that there would be an attempted communist coup in Australia itself. Um, a lot of the Union members used to have regular trips to Moscow. They were well fated there. Many of the unions were communist. Um, again, it will be outside most of your memories, but during the war, troops had to load ships for supplies to our troops in the Middle East because in the early part of the war, it was an imperial aggressive war and the communist dead waterfront in Sydney would not load the ships. 
Uh, so Chifley or Curtin, to their credit, put troops in to do that job. As soon as Russia was attacked by Germany, it became an honourable people's war, and of course the war... <laughs> so that, that was just an example of the sort of problem that was extraordinarily real in those days. Um, and there were a lot of people who felt that you know, socialism is something where governments would own everything and people would own nothing, um, and that the only real difference between socialism and communism was that the socialists wanted to do it by democratic means, very devoutly, um, while communists were totally prepared to do it by the most violent means, but the end result was regarded as similar. And this was the frame through which you saw the Vietnam War, wasn't it? It was the frame through which I saw the Vietnam War. Um, now, uh, from hindsight, and totally from hindsight, um, I believe that Vietnam was very much a, a part of a, a national movement fighting for independence, um, and probably more that than an expression of the expansion of Soviet communism although it's worth noting that most of the weapons to the Viet Cong came from Russia and not from China. At the time, earlier on, we thought it was mostly Chinese weapons, but that wasn't so, it was Russian. So your understanding of communism, I think it's fair to say, has changed over time? Well, uh, what's communist? Um, what socialists left... Uh, the socialists left believed in nationalisation, socialisation and all that. Uh, they did not believe in privatisation. They did not believe in capitalism. Well, now the social left support all of those things. So they've changed very considerably. Um, China is still called communist and in deprecating terms by a lot of the media. Um, but China is so far from Soviet communism as, as practised by Stalin. Uh, you know, two totally different things. And um, there is a level of freedom in China which would surprise most people. Uh, it's not a democracy, and as we understand democracy, obviously. But one thing you need to know about China is that any government, whether it happened to be democratic or communist or socialist or fascist in China, would want to keep a very strong central government because whenever China has had a weak central government from Beijing, China has disintegrated into warring provinces with many people dying of starvation, with many t tens, hundreds, millions, I suppose, being killed in the conflicts. So maintaining the integrity of China as a whole, which does mean a strong central government for them, uh, is going to be paramount in the minds of Chinese involved with politics or government. Um, it's a remarkably different country from the time... When I first went to China, everyone was in grey Mao uniforms about 1976. The next time I went there, they were all in, uh, in suits and coloured clothes and dressed uh, as you're dressed. Uh, probably they all had coats and ties on, very neatly done. Um, but um, it, it was beginning to be a much more open and relaxed society. And that movement has gone on. There's been a lot of... I think there's paranoia in this country about China. When they increase their defence vote, China's rearming, why, why not? Well, their nuclear missiles, they have about the same number as Britain. Maybe 50 more than Israel? Does that make you think? Maybe 100 more than Israel, where the Americans and the Russians have... Um, 23 or 4,000 each, but now they're going to cut that, and that's a very good thing. Um, we, we, we're not good at understanding China, where it comes from, how it looks at the world. We apply our standards of judgment to China, which I think is a grave and serious mistake, because we're not really quite as virtuous as we sometimes believe we are. We have our own problems, our own difficulties. Well, the Rudd, the Rudd government, um, of course, would claim to understand China. There was that famous moment when Kevin Rudd spoke in Chinese. Um, do they? Well, Does he? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, the press then started to say we were too close to China. 
Now, that could be moved uh, into a, a, a political minus. So we've seen a defense white paper which names China as a potential problem, which I think, you know, to me it was the most regressive and stupid defense white paper that I'd seen in 40 years. Um, well, the, the worst one I'd ever seen, I suppose. And then um, uh, the government has made a number of statements about this recent court case in China, for example. Um, and we're told that China has, by the government, a legal standard like no other, as though it's the worst in the world. Well, it, it's probably not worse than a lot of other countries in the world. And a lot has been made about the alleged secrecy of some parts of the trial. But judges in Australia can order a part of a trial to be held in secret, with the press kicked out. On a different level, uh, family law reporting is minimal because names can't be used, and that tends to make people very uninterested in what's happening. Um, and if national security is involved in an Australian court case, I'm sure a government would either argue that the evidence should not be given or that evidence should be undertaken in private with the press and the public kicked out. On your definition of communism and socialism, was Gough Whitlam a socialist? Um, I think they're the wrong words. I'm, I'm afraid... He, I, I think he had aspirations for Australia. He had a sense of Australian identity. He had a sense of Australian independence... He would certainly not have just willingly wanted to go along with America, but he would have recognised the importance of the American alliance. I don't want to say it in an unkindly way, but in some respects, especially in economic matters, he was disorganised. Um, <laughs> That's a very kindly way. Sure. And, I mean, we're um, talking about the loans affair, aren't we? It's, uh, well, the loans affair, the but the budgets is... too. I mean, uh, one year... The budget, federal budget increased by over 40% one year to the next. The next year it increased by about 22% one year to the next, in real terms. And that year the economic writers said, oh, this is a responsible budget. Well, where have the economic writers gone? You know, they, they would all probably have torn up the reports they wrote in those days uh, because nobody would regard a 22% increase except in time of war or total national emergency or something as in any way responsible. Um, so where this fits in, in in terms of the political lexicon, I'm not sure. Did John Kerr do the right thing and did, did he do it in the right way? Oh, he did the right thing. He was in the very unfortunate position of being condemned or going to be condemned for doing the right thing, which I think he was or being condemned for not doing the right thing, which he would have been if, he, if there had not been an election. Um, it, 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 I, I think there are many myths about 1975. And as you know, I tried not to talk about it very much. Because every, the 5th anniversary, the 10th anniversary, the 15th, 20th, 30th, every anniversary. And if people can and develop half-year anniversaries, they'll do it again. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, I, I just think it's been a bit chewed over. Um, but um, one more time, John. John, <laughs> John Kerr, uh, I know, didn't have fully open and frank discussions with Gough Whitlam because he felt he'd be sacked and a puppet would be put in his place, and that Australia would be very much at risk. Well. I think he had an obligation to speak openly to the Prime Minister and point out the dangers as he saw it. Now, that, if John Kerr in his fear was right and he was sacked, that would have immediately brought Her Majesty into the brawl because the monarchists, um, who, who are certainly the more um, fundamental monarchists, and monarchists can be fundamentalists, as a lot of other people can too, uh, and um, th th they would have said the Queen should be a backstop and therefore will not accept uh, and, and not remove uh, John Kerr from the office. But 
Ever since the appointment of Isaac Isaacs as Governor General, the monarch has accepted, I believe, that the monarch has no option but to accept the recommendation of her Australian Prime Minister. There is no option. She would have had to accept, but the Queen would have been brought in to the brawl um, by monarchists who believe that she should have been... There was a lot of talk about backstops at the time. She w would never have been, couldn't have been, and John Kerr knew this. And one thing for which he's not got credit, and he should get credit, he was determined to keep Her Majesty out of the brawl. And he did that, absolutely. I mean, the palace was kept informed, I know that, of what was happening. But never once was the palace asked for an opinion, for a view, for advice. Um, just kept informed, and it was left at that.